This is Reimagining Higher Education, your go-to podcast with remarkable education leaders sharing personal stories from their experience in and around the sector, including reflection and evidence for progress in the sector. With your host, Studiosity's founder and president of Friends of Libraries Australia, Jack Goodman. Well, I'm, I'm here today with Marlon Crossley, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor at UNSW, and uh, welcome, Merlin. It's great to see you. Great to see you, Jack. Yeah. Look, we'd love to start these conversations off, um, offer, giving our, um, our, our guests an opportunity to share some sort of an object or a memento that's related to their learning journey. Um, I don't know. Have you brought something along that uh, I you want to have a look at? I've bought this. That is, do you know what that is? That's a... Uh, it's, it's a fancy uh, shell. It's a it's seashell a, yeah. of some sort. It's a paper nautilus. So I'm a biologist. So yeah. I'm fundamentally always, I sort of got into all this stuff because I loved animals. Uh, and that is actually an eggshell from an octopus. So it looks really? like a nautilus. It looks like a nautilus. The octopus sits in there and shoots along um, across the ocean and has an air bubble there that keeps it buoyant. The female's quite big, the male's absolutely tiny, and uh, the octopus actually secretes it. To me, it's 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 beautiful, but it's not what you would expect because it looks like uh, it looks like a sh seashell. Yeah. Uh, but it's the octopus secretes it with its legs. It's one of the strangest things, and I've always wanted one. I found this in a shop in Adelaide. You can find them on the coast. I've never found one on the coastline, but people find them on the coast. But wow! <laughs> just because it's so amazing, and yeah. the natural world. You know, this connection with the natural world, animals, pets, urban wildlife, that's the sort of thing that I, I just, that's the way I started. Um, and so that's why I brought that along. Wow. Well, that's a fantastic starting point. I think I'm, I'm probably not alone in saying I, I don't know that much about octopuses, although like many people, we, uh, you may have watched the, that movie, My Friend the Octopus, yeah. or whatever it was called. Yeah. It was quite interesting, and, and we all learned probably more about octopuses, those of us who are not, not biologists or naturalists, than we ever knew. Um, did you watch, did you see that movie? Yeah, I did. And, you know, the, the thing that octopuses are really intelligent, uh, octopodes, they're really intelligent, they're, they're different, uh, they have behaviors, and it's sort of, yeah, it makes you think that, yeah, the world is still full of surprises. Yeah, it really is. Uh, that's absolutely right. Well, that's a great jumping off point to sort of get into your own personal learning journey. And, uh, you know, I've read a little bit about it and there's a, there's a bit published on the internet. Uh, you've got your own little Wikipedia page, which is always impressive. But, um, but I thought you might just sort of share with us how you went from, um, I guess, suburban Melbourne to, you know, um, to, to university and then on to bigger and bigger things um, overseas. Can you tell us a little bit about maybe what sort of what are the key sort of moments in that or when you really discovered your love of animals and biology? Yeah, so I'd always loved animals and biology, but I, so I went to, yeah, I went to primary school, like school, was good at maths. You know, if you're good at maths, a lot of doors open for you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was interested in writing and history and biology and everything. So I sort of enjoyed school. I mean, it was one of those ages where it was sort of okay to be fairly nerdy. Uh, and I enjoyed school, went to university. When I was going to university, I originally, yeah, I didn't really know what to do, but I was gonna do law and then people said, why would you want to do law? And I, and I thought, no, I really want to study biology. So I studied biology. Always sort of wondered what it would have been like to study law because I've got so many good friends who are lawyers and it's sort of fun. I like arguing with people, but I studied <laughs> biology. Uh, I do. I love it. And, yeah. uh, and I, yeah, gradually I found my way. And I think I was like most 17-year-olds, you don't know what you want to be uh and in those days i had sort of confidence that not that many people went to university if you were serious about it if you really enjoyed it opportunities would open up and that's exactly what happened to me i think it's harder now but yeah. in those days 
I, there was it was still an era where you were fairly confident and you just threw yourself into it fairly optimistically. Okay, I'm not going to ask a, a, a too, too um, personal of a question, but what year did you start university? Oh, so 82. 1982. Okay, so that's pre, pre-Dawkins reforms. And that was at yeah. Melbourne? Yeah. So how many students would have been at Melbourne back, back then? Look, there must have been... Undergrads, you know, let's say. 15,000, 15, I would say. It was still a big university. It was, you know, yeah. The difference then was there weren't as many international students as there are now. But oh, it was in a fraction. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It that was, was just that. beginning. There were some international students, but it was just beginning. And it was right. before HEX. So, you know, right. we weren't paying for it. Yeah, yeah, free. Yeah. Wow. So it was a totally different time. But you had to choose a choose a, a degree or a course. So you had to make that decision about biology or law. I don't know how many other people would have been throw, tossing up those two <laughs> options. <laughs> kind of unusual. But, uh, but you had to make that decision uh, before you enrolled, no? Yeah, so I actually involved in law science and dropped law on the first day. Um, okay, so which you is went sort of a weird thing to do, but um, <laughs> but it was because it was also because if you got the marks for something, you didn't want to waste them. Students still feel that way about their ATARs and things, and I was sort of caught up in that. And then I thought, no, nah, I'm just going to throw my burn my bridges, go for biology, and I did, and that led me. To molecular biology, which is something that I didn't even know about when I started. I mean, that's the other thing that you, when you start, you don't know, you only know general things. That's why people are interested in pure science rather than applied things, because they don't know. Uh, I didn't know about all about DNA and recombinant DNA and all that stuff, but that's what I ended up doing. Well, it was all really just emerging back then in the, in the, mid 80s yeah, right that's right yeah it yeah. was it was pretty clear that it was taking off yeah it was going to take off but there was huge investments being made but it hadn't you know it was you got in at the right time too that's right that's absolutely right there is a right time for everything and there's luck in that yeah i remember listening to a story once talking about was it was it a coincidence or was it just timing that all of these uh, silicon valley billionaires were all almost exactly the same age and it had to do with the confluence of what of growing up with access to personal computers at just the right time and just the right confluence of events that they could find themselves in those circumstances. So I think you you happen to make the right choice. You could be a lawyer anytime you want, but <laughs> having the career that you've had um, in uh, as a bi- as a molecular biologist is a, is a different story. Yeah, and. Um, and you made that transition. You, you, you managed to score yourself a, uh, a, a Rhodes without being a, uh, a boxer or a rower yeah. or uh, some sort of a, uh, an elite athlete. How, how do you pull that off? That's a good question. So again, it, it sort of depends. It was, it's to do with the context, right time, right place. So I think there had been, so it was, for start, it was in Melbourne. And Melbourne was the least obsessed with, um, being a boxer like Tony Abbott. Uh, <laughs> you picked that there's up. There's <laughs> a bit of a rejection of that sort of thing. So as yeah. long as you were sort of keen doing extracurricular stuff and that that sort of pervades the Rhodes community more now. There's a lot more diversity in things. I think that I was again at the time when they were shrugging off the sort of boxing, rugby playing, macho, Mm-hmm. sort of me Tarzan type stuff and looking for a slightly nerdier different type of people and again it's it's all in the timing uh, so yep. you know and so I think you know I sort of fitted the mold of, of someone who was oh, I was a pretty nerdy intellectual actually and I think they quite like that yeah yeah okay and uh, so so three years at Oxford doing a a, a, a defill, I guess we'll call yeah. it. Yeah, right. So we got another lingo. Um, what do you think? What was that like? So that was, you know, so that was intense in terms of. So I worked in a lab. I worked on a disease, hemophilia. That's the one right. um, Queen Victoria's family had. Absolutely focused, absolutely intense. I admired. It's interesting, I'm sort of reading through the way you do these podcasts and thinking about what it was like. 
I had this sort of thing that when I grew up, I used to hero worship a lot of people from history and the past and and then my contemporaries and seniors, I looked up to lots of people. So, you know, I was in Oxford where Howard Florey did yeah, penicillin okay. um, in that department, uh, Florey and Chain. Um, Edward Abrahams came up with the next class of antibiotics. You, I was very aware my supervisor had cloned the gene for cloning factor nine. We were sort of really aware that this was, you expected to do world-class stuff. You expected to think of it. I've really admired the postdocs in the lab. I was a student studying. I had people, there's some from Australia. There were some very good Australian postdocs, some from all over the UK, Europe, other students, very intense and focused. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I loved it. I mean, most of it was in the lab. Most of it was professional, learning to be right. a professional. I mean, I did other things, you know, I rode for the the graduate boat in college and I, yeah. I did all the, the sort of things, playing squash and, and riding <laughs> my bike around the countryside and going to pubs in the evening and talking about politics with all my fellow students who many of them were Marxists and, you know, learning <laughs> all that stuff, reading all the literature, you know, Tolkien yeah. and... Mm -hmm. and reading all the history and stuff but it was but it was the absolute focus of science and realizing how intensely committed these people of the past were and right. that was pretty good yeah yeah did you stay on in the uk or i mean i think you spent some time at harvard no, as well only, only a year or so then i went over to the u.s and that was at, at Harvard. What was yeah. what, what, so, so how long were you there? What was that? What do you think? What do you think of uh, you, you spent some time at the, you know, these universities that are somewhere in the, the top three or five or eight, depending on which of these rankings you look at. I'd love to hear. I think I'm sure people would love to hear your perspective coming from Melbourne about what what they're yeah. really like. The so truth, please, Merlin. <laughs> so that's really interesting. So when I got to Oxford, I thought to myself, goodness, you know, the Kids at Oxford have been um, had the tutorial system. They've had one-on-one -on -one tuition. They've been selected. I'm going to be so much out of my depth. It's not. Yeah. Gonna, it's not going to be funny. That was not the case, uh, and it wasn't just me. There were other Australians. Uh, the reason the Australians were good is because we do three years and then an honours project for a full year, and we were pretty practical. And there was this sort of you know, this pioneering thing of Australians being pretty much can do and practical and Australians and, you know, on the sporting field too, you know, Australians always did quite well. Uh, so in Oxford, I was pleasantly surprised. And then when I got to Harvard, Harvard was interesting. Harvard was actually more intense than Oxford. People had come from all over the world and yeah, on my first day, almost my supervisor at Harvard said to me, you know, we've got quite a lot of money in the lab. You can do whatever you, whatever ideas you have, you can follow any of them. And the pressure in that was absolutely intense because what that meant was that if you failed, you really had no one to blame but yourself. It was actually easier in a system where, well, I'd love to, you know, hop in this boat and uh, discover America, but really I can only afford half a boat. So perhaps I'll just map this shoreline, you know. Right. Because once you got to Harvard, you could do anything. Right. And then we had this. Uh, There's the risk of doing nothing at that point. Yeah. So, and there was massive pressure to take big risks and not just do little things. And I can remember there was a work in progress seminar where, they'd get people from different labs to sort of form a community and everyone talk about what they were doing. Every single person who spoke had discovered something spectacular because if you hadn't discovered anything spectacular yet, you didn't speak yet. And there were plenty of people. So right. that was, it was really intense. People worked hard, but, you know, again, we had in our mind that, if you wanted to stay there, it was going to be like that forever, but you didn't have to stay there. There were all sorts of other places in the world. You saw the Harvard system, I don't know if it's true, but apocryphally, 
Uh, only one out of 100 assistant professors got tenure. So 99% of them didn't get tenure and went on to be a professor somewhere else. That was the system. <laughs> we all knew that was the system. There was no shame in that. Uh, so it was good. The friends that I made there are my lifetime friends, and but they were hugely efficient. Uh, that was the, the real thing I learned from America. I didn't even know what the word efficiency meant. I sort of thought, what is, what's efficiency meant? And what it meant was spending, if a job should take one minute, you do it in one minute, you get on to the next job, you're constantly moving, you're constantly being judged by what have you done today, not what you've done over your career, not what mark you got in finals or what mark you got in the HSC, but what have you done in the last six months? Uh, highly competitive, but hugely collaborative. Uh, and they continue to be really good like this. The sky's the limit. Uh, you know, it's a great, it's a great place, but it's, uh, you know, it never sleeps. Yeah. And were you just doing postdoctoral research there? Or were you teaching at all? No, I was only, I was just doing postdoc for four years in um, a lab with 20 postdocs in Harvard Medical School. So, so I never really took the, the path that people take of, um, I didn't stay there. Right. Yeah. Wow. Well, and, and I guess, and then, and then is that the point at which you came back to Australia? Yeah, I came back to Sydney University to a lectureship in biochemistry. It was a, it was a fixed term position. And then uh, I, I got converted to a continuing position and worked my way up the ranks through Sydney University as a very conventional uh, yeah. teaching and research academic. Yeah, the 40-40-20 thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Does that, how did that work for you? Were you able to, you feel like you were able to do both jobs as in being a, a, a teacher and a researcher, or was it always a struggle? Um, so to look, do, did, did, did you feel like you were torn between them? That's the absolutely key question. So when I came back, I toured around a lot of places looking for a job in Australia. And I was told really clearly by people that I, you know, I told you I've got a lot of heroes. People I really admire said, don't go to a university department. You'll get too much teaching. You won't be able to compete internationally. And you won't have the critical mass of colleagues to support your work in technologies. So your, your research will fade. And I think that that's been true of a lot of people. Uh, it didn't happen to me. I wanted to teach. I wanted, I like, I like theatre. I like the perpetual youth of universities. I like the optimism of young people. And I like the completely open horizons. If you go to a research institute, you know, it might be the Heart Research Institute or a Cancer Research Institute uh, or a Genetics Research Institute, whatever they are, they tend to have one focus. Whereas a university department, you really have that completely open uh, horizon. In theory, in practice, you can only do research if it gets funded. So you're constrained by what can be funded, but it's pretty open. And I like the academic community and I liked, I wanted to be connected to people in other disciplines and things like that. So I always wanted to go to a teaching department. So I went to a teaching department, but you know, I have to be honest about this, Jack. I wasn't 20, 40, 40. I was 90% research, 10% teaching and 10% administration. I absolutely focused on the research and did my teaching. I got it down pat. I loved doing it, but absolutely I was in and out and back to the lab uh, for the first 10 years as an academic. Right. And right. the systems, so you've got to remember, we talked about timing and actually this is a really key theme, knowing what's right for the time. So I remember when Web of Science put out H indices and citation scores and impact factors, none of them existed when I was uh, an undergraduate, but they all appeared and took over while I was a junior lecturer. And I looked at them and I thought, wow, I've got to pay attention to those things. <laughs> and so I put a huge amount of effort into H indices, impact factors, 
That's Glass the scorecard. All, all the scorecard. Now, that's an interesting thing. I cared about teaching because I had my pride and I enjoyed it. So I cared and I made it as, as fun and as good as I could be, but I did not spend 40% of my time on it. Right. Yeah. It's an interesting, it's an interesting question. And, and, and you obviously would have seen and, and, and some, some really talented teachers, lecturers at Melbourne, Oxford, Harvard, but you probably also saw people who weren't so great and maybe there was not necessarily a correlation. I don't know. Was there a correlation between the ability to teach and, and, and reputation or was it, was the reputation that you saw primarily about those people who made those big discoveries? Look, there's a correlation. The top researchers were always extremely inspiring. Uh, and so some of those top people that I saw around the world were inspiring, even if they weren't necessarily the most organized and the best people to teach you how to fold your parachute, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. But, <laughs> but I also saw the other thing, which was at um, the place I started, there were a couple of absolutely inspiring uh, level A and level B hadn't necessarily even got a doctorate teachers who were absolutely superb and were the lifeblood of the department and were loved by the students and organized everything that weren't being promoted or recognized in the system uh, and my career really depended on those people because they brought in a great cohort of students that ended up being PhD students with my, me and so one of the things I've really tried to do is to create a scoreboard for good teachers so they can be promoted to professor and right. we really are doing that at UNSW with education focused staff that uh, you've got to have a scoreboard and once you have the scoreboard you can recognize and reward great teaching. Now, some people don't like it because scoreboards can be pernicious as well, but I think it's critically important and we are doing it now. Yeah, well, it's a good transition. I, was, I, I, gotta, I have to ask, I mean, having had the, the academic trajectory that you've had, um, what made you want to, I'm not gonna say give it up because I gather you still do some, some research, but really sacrifice it to go into university administration. Like so what, still, when did that happen? Yeah, so that happened completely by accident. And no, I've kept it going. So we're still going as, as strongly as we ever have. Uh, and that's because I've got a team of people who work with me and it, I try to create it so it's a win-win. And I, largely it has been for my career and their careers. Uh, I really, uh, I went into academic admin completely by accident. I applied for a, a job, a professorship. I didn't get it. Uh, they needed an acting dean at Sydney. I was asked to do it. I, like any sort of male does, I said, sure, I'll, I'll give it a go. I turned out to be a good manager for the surprising reason that I did so little managing that uh, <laughs> that at a university every someone everyone is so smart really is the less you do the better and always I've believed that uh, you have to make sure the boat doesn't tip over but you know other people know best so I've always and I think it's actually good the other thing is that I've sort of got my drive and things I still put into my research and teaching and in administration, I let other people, other people push it as, as much as possible. So yeah, I've been quite an accidental manager. Uh, so I was acting Dean of Science for a year at Sydney. Then I was acting DVC research for three years. Then I came to UNSW with Dean of Science, but a Dean of Science, you'll see of all the deans, they tend to maintain their research if you look across the sector. So I did. And then I, I thought about what I wanted to do next if I wanted to keep going. And I went into DVC Academic because I really felt everything was out of kilter. Research had taken over too much. Yeah. And 
we could boost teaching without doing any harm for research. And I really think that's what I'm trying to do. And we are trying to do that. Well, I, I think that's, it, it, it is very interesting to, to me. Um, you're now the, the DVC. Well, I guess the, the role is being split. Is that right? So you're at the- Yeah, so I'm academic quality now. So I think right. that, which is, you know, they want to bring, so UNSW really recognizes that it needs to increase, improve the student experience. So they want to bring in a new person to do mm -hmm. that and to to push uh, yeah. new technologies and new opportunities in teaching. And, and I think that's right. I can't do it all. And so the yep. portfolio was big. So so it's it's fine. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if I think about what the um, the university you are, you know, one of the the academic leaders of right now at UNSW and compare it to in 2022, I guess you've been in, in some form of that DVC role since what, 2016? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in the last six years, but, but what, what that university is like, just in terms of scale and scope compared to, let's say, uh, University of Melbourne in 1982 or 83, um, it's really quite transformative, isn't it? I mean, it would be easily four or five times bigger than Melbourne was back then. Um, and all, and all of the, the the big universities have become that sort of size, and 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 huge numbers of international students as well. So it's an entirely different kind of a place, right? So it's the same but different. So the real difference is, is that there's a really big business school, and there's a really big master's coursework cohort in business and in engineering at UNSW. And mm -hmm. those things were not there in the 80s. Right. But it's not so different beyond that. I mean, the scale of dollars spent on research is bigger, but it was cutting edge research back when I was doing it. And, you know, at, at Melbourne when I was an honor student, and it, it's still the same. Now, the medical research institutes are much bigger than they were. Uh, and in Melbourne, they're really world class and, and, and dominant. And, and we've got some good ones too. But really, the only difference, so the difference is, yeah, there's a scale difference. Uh, and there's a postgraduate difference, and they have two impacts. So the the scale of students, once you increase the scale of students, you increase the diversity of preparedness to study. Right and the diversity of um, affluence, which also yeah. means preparedness to study. Mm -hmm. And so a lot more students are working part-time. That's a big difference. And then the coursework cohort, that's a completely different beast, uh, but it's largely confined to the business faculty and the engineering faculty. Right, but you did you did refer there to the widening participation agenda, I yeah. guess, and the, the yeah. um, really dramatic increase in the, percentage of people we would like to see holding a, a bachelor's qualification. And that all came out of the, the Bradley review in 2007 or eight. Um, but, uh, and that, and that really do, did transform in some way, many ways, the student body at a place like UNSW. Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. I think that's, yeah. If we talk about what's happened during our, our sort of time, your time and my time, it is this, that, university was a good thing so let's make it available to as many people as possible and that has been a massive success but the costs have been that it's a little bit less personal and it's a little yeah. bit it's a little bit more challenging because the the students are lost but also the staff are struggling to to support such a wide range of students right yeah well i, I mean i and I'll tell you where I'm, where I, I'm coming from. I, I'm struggling with these questions around: uh, is there a is there a right size for a university? This is a question Glenn Davis has asked, right? Um, and a lot of people have asked this. Um, you know, how big should universities be? And did we lose some diverse, a lot of diversity in the in the Dawkins reviews? And we 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 now have these forty effectively very very large, relatively similar institutions, and and and. And they do certain things great. Like obviously research has been, I mean, if, if, if we were to say much like the academics are meant to be 40, 40, 20 research, teaching, administration, 
does a universe does the, does UNSW put forty percent of its effort into research and forty percent of its effort into teaching and twenty percent into admin, or is there a is there a skew there as well institutionally? Yeah, so there's a couple of different questions there. First of all, and they're both important questions, the size of universities. So I agree with you that, yeah, Glenn Davis has talked about this. He's right. Australian universities are very big. Uh, I think they are too big, but I'll tell you what I think the answer to that is. So if you look at the way a university like Oxford grew, it grew one college at a time. Yeah. It's totally different. Well, it also grew over 1,100 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And growing one college at a time means that it doesn't ever seem so big because people are connected right. to a college. And, you know, right. even if you look at, you know, Harry Potter with Gryffindor and Slytherin, <laughs> you know, you know, why is it divided into houses? It's divided right. into houses because if it gets too big, people start to lose their identity yeah. The place yeah. and their sense yeah. of belonging. And, but if you talk to anyone, they say, you know, why did universities grow? So in Glenn Davis's book, he points out that the regulation of universities in Australia is such it's hard to form new ones. So as the uh, education was made available to more, the existing ones grew. And that's part of it. The other part of it is that uh, Australia's never funded research costs properly that as you go into, you know, when I started, we used a little um, a tiny centrifuge in a, a gel box. Now you need a sort of super collider, a mass spec <laughs> right. machine, a Hubble tel space telescope. Right. The only way you do that is through economies of scale of student teaching. And so right. universities have been absolutely hungry for international enrollments, particularly the group of eight, where the research costs are very heavy. And so we've got those two reasons have caused the... So if you think of a university like a balloon, we just keep blowing up this balloon. Well, that's not a good strategy. <laughs> It'd be better if you had a bunch of different balloons. So yeah. segmenting yeah. universities to a certain extent into uh, cohorts. So you see all these boutique degrees, like you know, little degrees in sort of you know biotechnology or medicinal chemistry or in advanced science. These are all attempts to give students a little bit of identity. It's okay with law or something, or vet science, you know, veterinary science. So there are all yeah. sorts of ways to give people a community within a larger community. And you see it with Sydney, the city of villages and things like that. You get these little communities. I think that's the way the world is. I'm not an expert on history and things, but it is like parish churches, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that, that you don't, you don't try to control everything for Rome. You have all these little parish churches which replicate the feeling. So I think, I think humans need these little communities. I think it has been challenging during the period of huge growth, but we had a growth stall with COVID and now people are coming back. We've got a little bit of a pause and I think yeah, it's important that we compartmentalize a bit. There's also a feeling People are in love with sort of interdisciplinary connections and and making things bigger and global ideas and all this sort of thing. But I think little local communities are what I try to fashion as much as I can. Yeah, that's really interesting. And 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 that metaphor of of, of the balloon being blown up. I mean, I, I hope we're not getting to the point where where, where the inevitable happens um, and it pops. But um, you know, there's some interesting thoughts there that you've suggested or hinted at about ways we might be able to uh, divide the balloon into multiple balloons. Um, yeah. But that, yeah, that 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 question about um, that, that I asked, and it just sort of had occurred to me, which was, um, does does should the university, whether it's UNSW or you know any Australian university, but should it seek to replicate in its own investment? Um, some some reflection of that 40 40 20 rule uh that it seeks um, acknowledging that you know in the sciences which is where the, the the big rankings reside generally speaking uh are become incredibly expensive you need hubble telescopes as you say and those don't just come off the shelf at bunnings but um but have we have we have we un misbalanced our, our investment on the uh the teaching and learning side relative to the research side 
Yeah, you're right to come back to that question because I didn't get to it. Look, I think, I think Jack, the question's right, but I don't think it was all to do with people devaluing it. It was, again, I think because we didn't have the right scoreboards for measuring it. Right. So I, people say if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I don't know if that's true. It's a useful phrase. Uh, I say <laughs> you can't, if you can't measure it, you can't sustain investment in it. You mm. need some comfort. You need some sort of recognition and accountability that your investment is working. So, right. I'm, and I get into a bit of trouble in, for this, but I'm a great fan of student experience surveys and the quilt, because yep. I think that imperfect and even as misleading as those data can be, if interpreted, uh, if they're not interpreted properly, they give people comfort that things are working and they allow people to invest their whole careers in them. Right. So, you know, and what we're trying to do at UNSW, and I don't want this to be an advert for UNSW, but we really have said... Oh, don't worry, it won't that, be. <laughs> yeah, that we've got, you know, we've got batters, bowlers, and all-rounders, and we need some people who uh, in their DNA is to be a researcher and they yep. just focus on research. Some people who are all-rounders, I think I was an all-rounder, and uh, other people who are uh, teachers and... But all of those people need a scoreboard and they need to be able to demonstrate, hey, they're really valuable for the team and then we need to invest in them. And right. I think the international league tables, oh, people think they're really important for attracting international students. I think they are and they aren't. I, I, you know, My own view is the league tables are sort of steady now and they don't change very much. So... I think if we, uh, I think the student experience in quality and investing in that's important as well. And we're trying to invest in that and we will do it by investing in education focused staff who provide a good experience and uh, we'll do it by supporting uh, student life as well. And then we'll keep investing in the research which is inspirational and part of uh, a first rate education yeah. to have the research there as well so i think we have got the balance slightly wrong uh yeah. but we need a scoreboard to help fix that well i'm glad you brought up quilt because i've got my copy right here okay. and i'm sure you have your copy somewhere yeah, yeah. um on, on the wall um and you did mention that concept of belonging which i think is uh is super important and and people feeling part of a community and that and and, and i just have spent a fair amount of time going through just the, just the public parts of Quilt. I haven't seen the level of the data that no doubt you know you, you and, and each university have access to um, because something like 200,000 people responded to the, to the survey out of about 600,000 requests. Um, and I think you had about a 41% response rate at UNSW. But that belonging concept, and, and, which is so critical to people um, and, and, and is all tied up in the Quilt, which really does provide a scorecard um, about that, it's all tied up in that learner engagement data. Um, that's really where the, the, the quilt um, brings that out. And when you look at that learner engagement data right across the whole sector, um, it's the weakest performing part of the quilt data. Uh, going all the way back to 2012, this is not pandemic related. This is, um, you know, high 50s learner engagement across the, the, the university sector um, from 2012. And then, of course, collapsing at during the pandemic to, you know, well under 50% and still remaining in that sort of range. Um, that's a pretty good scorecard, isn't it? For the sector to be thinking about, and you can look at each university as well, but, but that, that does, that does provide us a benchmark. So the, the particular one, the learner engagement one is a complicated measure of five different questions. Yeah. And when you look at the five different questions and drill down at which universities are doing well and which universities aren't on those five different questions, you get some surprises, actually. It's quite difficult to really be sure what that number is measuring. At face right. value, it looks dreadful. It looks like, hey, our students don't have a sense of belonging. Hey, we should fix that. I actually think it's a little bit more complicated. And if you look at the questions, yeah, I think that 
I think that there is there's a little bit of danger in um, thinking there's the problem. I see the problem. We can fix that. Uh, I'm, I'm going through reading the comments of the students at the moment, and it's really amazing. So the students have a very, uh, their, their experience is largely dependent on the lecturers they had that term. <laughs> they comment sure. on you know, whether they had a great time, whether there's, they didn't, and then they comment on, on whether they were overwhelmed or not. There's a recency and, bias, of course, with a survey no, like that. Yeah, and it's sort of it's sort of interesting because, you know, we're not one of the leading universities where at the, the tail end, but it's remarkable how many students have a great time. And then some of them say, you know, I was overwhelmed and I didn't get the help that I, I needed. And so it's this patchwork. And I think that I really like the data. I think the, the data is valid and we should respond to it, but the devil is in the detail. And so I sort of, and farming out analysis of this data across the university and trying to work out what we need to do and celebrating the good parts. So that's that's what I think we should all do. And that's actually what happens in research. We celebrate, you know, Rosalind Franklin and Watson in Creek. Right. We celebrate Howard Florey. We celebrate Michelle Simmons in a quantum computer. You know, right. we celebrate the great stuff. And that's what we need to do with the teaching. You know, right. because if I tell you, you know the sector quite well, uh, you yeah. probably got a bit of a feel for some of the people who are inspirational teachers to their students. I want those people to be as famous as uh, yeah. you know our, our instrumental researchers are. But we have to acknowledge also, right, that uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of the however many tens of thousands, 60, 70,000 students at UNSW are not at UNSW to become world-class researchers. They're absolutely there for a, some aspect of career progression and trajectory or opportunity. Um, there's a real, you know, your, your academic career is, you know, and, and is, is, is a very small sliver, isn't it, of what most people, of, of the whole cohort of undergraduates, let's say, at UNSW, who are mostly there to, um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a strong, you know, vocational urgency that people feel related to their study. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a profoundly important point. Uh, I still would sort of say that if you idolize Pele or something, it it means you you're probably going to enjoy playing football for your local team more. You know, uh, oh, I agree. I looking good. seeing excellence anywhere is yeah. is admirable. Yeah. Even if you know, I saw some incredible academics in my limited uh you know academic career and and they were marvels to watch even though i knew i had no hope of ever you know replicating that um and seeing it you know in any sort of a field is amazing seeing anyone put on a tour de force of a, of a lecture is a remarkable remarkable thing but i just i, I don't know what, what, what your sense is well here's a question for you merlin i mean you're reading all of these student comments and i've you know I read I read thousands of student comments yeah. every week as well, yeah. you know, just just in my day job. Yeah. Um, and you can see when people have a good experience, and you can see when they have a not so good experience, and you can dig into that a bit, and you can try and understand it. Um, but one of the thoughts that occurred to me as I was sort of preparing for this interview was to think: um, do, do 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 people in the administration um, at, at at our universities do they ever mystery shop? Do you ever go and sit in on? Lectures, or just sort of wander around the campus, maybe with a little disguise, maybe fake glasses and a, and a, and a hat on, um, so that no one knows who you are, and just sort of see, you know, what's it like being a student, or what is it like in this in this lecture hall, or how are people interacting? Interacting? Does that ever happen? Yeah, so it has. So Richard Buckland, a good friend of mine, professor in computer science, he uh, he did it with a vice chancellor. He did student for a day and took uh, the former vice chancellor Ian Jacobs around to mystery shop to do exactly that to get dressed as a student and turn up to lectures. So we do do it a little bit. I think we we could do it more. We do it a little bit with our uh, student support as well. So we do do some of that. I mean, that's a sort of fairly uh, standard approach to take yeah we could do we should do more of it yeah 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 just coming back to that um sorry just coming back to the quilt data one, one more time just just for for our listeners um 
that that learner engagement stuff. I just just so people people know those those questions um, that you were referring to, and the fact that it's kind of a little bit of a mixed bag. The first question is about whether you, the student has felt prepared for their study. Um, the next question is specifically, did you do you have a sense of belonging at your university? And then there's a series of I think another four questions about the amount or whether you participated in any discussions online or face to face with other students in your course or just more broadly at the uni and also specifically with local students, which I guess would be more directed at international students. So that's that's what it's trying to measure. And there's no doubt there's some amalgamation of, of, of several different ideas, but a lot of it does come back, I think, doesn't it, to that idea that we don't necessarily interact well as humans once we end up in a group of, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of students. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it's, I think that's, a shame in COVID's made it worse. And the other thing that has challenged us is the big difference from my day. You know, when I was a student, I worked a bit um, as a dishwasher, but but not not like students work now. I worked, you know, one night a week for part of my degree, but not right. for the whole degree. I did some summer jobs. I had a couple of summer jobs, but these days. It's like seventy percent of our students are working so much that it's a totally that's a totally different thing where students are working to survive, and I think that's a profound difference. We, you know, people are surprised at this, but the, the trimester calendar actually makes it easier to be a hard, part part time student because you can just do one course or two courses each term, uh, so you get more flexibility at doing that, but. This makes it very difficult when students are living two lives. It's a big difference from the English system where if you're getting a grant, a grant to go to university, or at least when I was there, it used to be, uh, you know, you had to go to university, not be working all the time. Right. That's you got some living expenses as well. Yeah. 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 That wasn't much, but, right. but it's, it's profoundly different. Yeah. I was going to ask that question. If you could change something for students now, what would it be? But it sounds like maybe it would be that you'd like to give every student some 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 living expenses money so that they don't have to work so much? Or is there something else you'd like to change? That would, that would be terrific if they didn't have to work so much. That would be terrific. But the other thing I'd like to do is free them up from um, assessment for a period of their studies so that they could they could feel they could fail without I'm sort of worried about people having everything they attempt indelibly on the scorecard. I just would say, let people explore, you know, if they want to play full forward, give them a try. If that doesn't work, let them go on the wing. If that doesn't work, perhaps they'd be better in the back pocket, but, but don't have this indelible mark that they're constantly being assessed right. relative to their peers every single moment of the day. And, and I think that inhibits students from, from exploring. D do you, uh, that's an interesting point because I because I think we I, I you know I've also heard a, 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 you know we do a lot of surveying of students as well and and there is a, co a substantial cohort of students who are very much of the of the mindset that P's get degrees they aren't yeah. necessarily so concerned about the marks I mean there's definitely some component and depending on the degree where students want to get um, distinctions and high distinctions but uh, but it's not it's not every it's not everybody and 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 as far as exploring goes I mean that 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 that's an interesting idea. Is there that much exploring that goes on within a within a course or you know of study that a student is doing? I mean, it's pretty it's pretty specialized already, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Uh, I think you know in the 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 big ones, Bachelor of Science, Arts, Commerce, those sort of ones, you can do a fair bit of exploring. But if you're doing uh, mechanical engineering or something, you know, yeah. that's what you do. Yeah, yeah. Look, we're getting, we've been running over time here. We're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to get in trouble um, with the, the powers of podcast um, land, but I do have one more question for you, if that's okay, Merlin, before I let you go. Um, and it's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of an introspective question. Um, and I hope it doesn't cause you to think too much about any regrets. We all have regrets in our lives, but, um, but if you could give yourself um, your younger self, some advice, what, what would that be now? And what would you say to some, some anyone who's an aspiring senior leader in the sector? Yeah, so the only thing that I think that I should have done, so I've benefited a lot from joining the establishment. 
when I was young, I was fairly anti-establishment, like most young people are. I sort of thought <laughs> the establishment's full of old fuddy-duddies, everything's wrong, they'll never change the world, you have to do everything independently. And I did, most of the things I did when I was young, I did independently with small groups of friends, it was fine, but I never really joined clubs, societies, establishment things. As I got older, I just sort of realised if you can't beat them, join them. And I joined yeah. this movement again and again. And I don't know whether I just got seduced and have become an old fuddy-duddy, but <laughs> I really think you can change things from the inside. I think, you know, Gorbachev changed things from the inside. De Klerk changed things from the inside. Uh, you don't you can change things from the inside. And often that's the most powerful way of changing something. So, you know, it is a strange thing to say, but I would say, yeah, get involved and try to change things from the inside because, and I think in Australia, we do that reasonably well, you know, because our establishment's not quite as remote as it is in some, some countries. Yeah, well, I would say, you know, I, I I would say those are interesting comparisons. I, I hadn't really thought we might we might possibly talk about the the recently deceased, yeah, ultimate Soviet leader, who 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 I guess you could say changed things from the inside, but you could also say that he blew up the balloon to the point where it finally exploded, and uh, and 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 left and 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 broke up the entire operation of the Soviet Union into whatever thirteen different nations, um, and 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 the clerk, I mean. At, at some point didn't have a choice in South Africa, right? And it was just overwhelming global condemnation and, and isolation. And there just needed to be some way of making peace. But um, yeah, that's an interesting, an interesting perspective on, on, on change from the change from the inside. I, look, I think this has been a great conversation. And as a, there's, I feel like we should do this again, because there's probably about 25 more questions that are going to occur to me. Um, and probably listeners as well we may we may hear from at some point so i, I hope you'll you perhaps come back and and we'll do this again this has been a lot of fun so look i've loved it any time and and a final thing i'd say is that the other way i think universities have changed is that they used to all be about learning all yeah. about learning and we don't talk about that enough and even in this podcast we haven't talked about that much you know that yeah. always, and i think you're right because they have become about jobs and yeah and that's that's fine and i understand people need jobs um absolutely but i think that's the biggest change during my time and uh you know it's great so it's great talking to you i've i've enjoyed it and uh yeah so anytime jack that's fantastic thank you so much merlin thank you visit studiosity.com slash students first for the next students first symposium an open forum for faculty, staff, and academics to candidly discuss and progress the issues that matter most in higher education. Studiosity.com slash students first.